America's Civil War, the clash of North and South, the Union versus the Confederacy. Today, many Americans proudly trace their ancestors back to the famous heroes from both sides, like Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman. But there are other names rarely heard except by those related by blood. My family has been in every war since the revolution. E. Lee Parker, Stan Waity, Henry Barry Lowry. Though largely forgotten today, more than 20,000 Native Americans fought in the Civil War. Native Americans, both uh, enlisted and officers, were in the trenches at every major battle. They would be recruited by both the North and the South. They were surrounded by two hostile camps that were pulling at their uh, existence. This is their untold story. The truth behind a war not of blue and gray, but of blue, gray, and the men both sides called red. It is the spring of 1861. The first shots have been fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, and the federal troops that occupied the fort have been taken by the Confederacy. Newly elected President Abraham Lincoln looks to the northern states to provide a 75,000-man militia. The call goes out for volunteers. They are only asked to serve a three-month stint, the time the North estimates will be needed to put down the insurrection. In Albany, New York, E. Lee Parker, a civil engineer who has been working for the government, attempts to answer Lincoln's call. Many of his co-workers have already enlisted. Because of their skills, most are immediately given officer commissions. But Parker comes away empty-handed. Though he has skills, education, and experience in the New York militia, he is also a member of the Tonawanda Seneca Indian Nation, where he serves as a high-ranking sachem, or chief. In the early part of the war, until May of 1862, there was no uh, Native American allowed into a regiment in western New York. There was racial discrimination reflected in the recruiting office and also there was a confusion because Native Americans weren't citizens and the question is whether you could enlist non-citizen Native Americans into regiments. Parker appeals the decision to Secretary of State William Seward to no avail. This, he is told, is a white man's war. But Parker is determined. He continues to press his case and recruits some powerful friends to lobby on his behalf, including one he met several years before. He served as an assistant engineer on the Genesee Valley Canal, and that experience brought him eventually to Galena, Illinois. Became fast friends with a worker in a harness store named Ulysses S. Grant. The two men, both with military backgrounds, also share a common frustration. Though Grant is a West Point graduate and a veteran of the Mexican War, his career has stalled, and he is reduced to working at his parents' store. Parker, who had been refused entry to the New York bar because of his race, can sympathize. He was an engineer, he was a lawyer, although not allowed to practice that. Their friendship is cemented when Parker comes to Grant's aid during a fight in a local tavern. Back to back they take on all comers. It is a gesture that Grant, a man known for his loyalty, will never forget. And that friendship that he made in the 1850s was to change his life forever. After the Civil War restarts his military career, Grant helps his old friend obtain a captain's commission then makes a place for Parker on his own military staff. When Grant uh, is appointed to the head of the Army of the Potomac in March of 1864, uh, he takes Ely Parker with him. He recruits Parker to become his military secretary, and he serves in that role through the end of the war. Ely is at his side every moment, including the battles themselves. Grant's staff would stay behind to do things, and Ely be right at Grant's side in those battles. By the end of 1863, Ely Parker was only one of many Native Americans in the field. 
the Union has come to realize, after being routed at Bull Run in Manassas, Virginia during the summer of 1861, that this will be no short-term war. Recruits will be needed for years, not months, as was once hoped, and northern recruiting practices have changed accordingly. At the beginning of the Civil War, it was primarily a white man's war. White men went to the colors, signed up, and there was no need for Native Americans. As the war continued, it became a butcher shop's list. Many men were being killed, they were sent home, they were sick, they were dying by the thousands. And many people were needed now. Any man who could carry a musket was needed. And that's when the Native Americans were allowed to come into the ranks. The massive casualties created a need for a population that the government until now had had little use for. From the moment the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock, according to the whites, there was an Indian problem. Now, this became the official business of Congress in 1830 when they passed the Indian Removal Act. This allowed them to take eastern tribes from their traditional homelands that they had perhaps been on for centuries, and they could move them to the unceded lands in the west. For decades, as the white population moved westward, the government pushed Native Americans to either assimilate or leave. By the start of the war, some 90,000 Native peoples had relocated to what is now Oklahoma. East of the Mississippi, there are only pockets of Native Americans left living on the fringes of white society in New York, Michigan, and the South. In the West, however, there is open warfare as the indigenous tribes clash with the whites, drawn by the California Gold Rush and the opening of the Oregon Trail. There were uprisings all throughout the West, in California, Arizona, Utah, and it would take the army 20 more years to get the West under control. But the tribes of the East are now seen as potential allies. Though each side will use propaganda criticizing the other for employing savages in battle, both North and South offer Native Americans higher and higher bounties to sign up. The Indians know they will get a $50 federal bounty, they will get a $25 state bounty, and that they will be paid $13 a month like every regular soldier in the regiment. The money was a big incentive. Other promises are made or implied. There may be rewards and recognition after the war, if they join the winning side. Some, like the Cherokees, uh, saw the advantages of joining the Confederacy based on the fact that the Confederacy offered a uh, position within the Confederate Congress in Richmond. The idea that they could be spokespersons in the Confederate Congress. Many Native Americans decided to join the Union Army to save the lands that they still possessed in the North. And they figured if they joined the Army, they would then have a stake in their country, and their country would recognize that. At least 20,000 Native Americans respond to these overtures, though some estimates put the number closer to 30,000. It is difficult today to single out Native Americans on the surviving roster lists. Many who joined were already assimilated, at least in part to white traditions, and had taken Christian names. Like the Williamses, the Joneses, you see, uh, the Lions, Parker, names like that, that are everyday English, including French names. Uh, these would be the names that they take. But there is no question they are there. Fighting for the North, integrated among both white and colored troops. And for the South, under both white and Native American commanders. Though they were often less well equipped than their white counterparts and doubtless faced the discrimination common in the day. The letters and diaries that survive reveal that many of the white enlisted men came to view the Native American recruits with respect. One of the white sharpshooters put out a small book at the end of the war, and he listed the Indians in Company K. And he said, here we had a group of men who could scarcely call this their own country, and they fought for it nonetheless. Many would fight with everything they had, not just for the Union, or the Confederacy, but for their own very personal reasons. 
It was a blood feud out here for many, many years. June 23, 1865. Nearly three months have passed since the fall of Petersburg, when the last of the Virginia blockades was broken and the Confederate capital in Richmond was finally breached. It has been more than two months since the commanders of the two weary armies met to sign the terms of surrender at the nearby outpost of Appomattox. But for some, the war is not yet over. One last act has yet to be played out at a prearranged spot not far from Fort Towson in what is now Oklahoma, an aging man in battle-worn clothes appears. He is Stan Waity, a brilliant Cherokee leader and tactician, the highest ranking Native American in the Confederate Army and the last Confederate general to surrender. He will do so under his own terms. The path that led him to this moment began not with the rift between North and South, but with a fracture within his own people. The breaking point came three decades before over a policy by the American government known as Indian removal. It would be as though someone would simply show up at your home and say, we're going to take you 2,000 miles away and leave everything that you know and everything you are familiar with behind. The destination the government set aside for this purpose was called Indian Territory. Some 70,000 square miles bordered by Texas on the south and Kansas on the north, comprising most of what is now Oklahoma. Here, the government built a series of forts largely to keep peace among the tribes forced to live in close proximity. The government, I expect, thought that one Indian could get along with the next Indian. But it would be like somebody putting somebody in your house and saying you're going to share this house with them and they're surprised when there's fighting who's going to get the master bedroom who's going to get the shower you know those kind of things in the civil war to come the indian territory will be used as a buffer zone between north and south but from the start there are conflicts within its borders that will erupt once again with the coming of the war some of the bloodiest were between members of the same tribe the Cherokees of southeastern Tennessee and northern Georgia. As a Cherokee citizen, I can speak very pointedly to the Cherokee removal. It meant internal uh, division. It meant civil war inside of the Cherokee Nation. In 1835, faced with growing pressure for removal, the Cherokees split into two groups factions which will impact the outcome of the Civil War some three decades later. One side, headed by John Ross, the principal chief of the Cherokee, refused to relocate. But the other half of the tribe believed that, with whites already encroaching on their lands in the south, relocation was inevitable. In December, some 20 leaders, including the family of Stan Waity, signed a treaty agreeing to move to the Indian Territory. I like to believe that they understood that the only way the Cherokee Nation would survive would be in a totally different environment, and that would be beyond the Mississippi. Chief Ross and his followers are left behind until the army forces them to make the move at gunpoint. A thousand mile march that will come to be known as the Trail of Tears. When Ross whose wife died along with 4,000 Cherokees on the trail, finally arrived in Indian territory, the stage is set for revenge against those who signed the treaty. These are names that were marked for death. If I have brought my family on the Trail of Tears and I have lost loved ones and I have lost my ancestral homelands, then I now can identify those that have caused that to happen, and I am now prepared to re-evoke a millennia-old tradition of the Cherokee people called the Blood Law. Among those marked for assassination under the Blood Law were Stan Waity and his relatives. On June 22, 1839, three of his family members were killed, his brother, uncle, and a cousin. 
Stan Weighty would have been in that group as well if not, if not having been warned and escaping from, from his home area to go into seclusion for days. It was then that Weighty gathered supporters of the treaty together and led a series of attacks against the Ross party. Those that signed were assassinated by those that didn't sign. And then those that were assassinated then took reprisals. That tipped off a back and forth murder environment in the Cherokee Nation that went on for years. It was Bloods and Crips, and it was murder elevated to an art form. In 1846, the U.S. took steps to halt the violence. Under the watch of peacekeeping troops in nearby Fort Gibson, the two factions were compelled to bury the hatchet. John Ross's status as principal chief was affirmed, and the Cherokees were once again one nation, but only on the surface. The Civil War will split the old wound wide open. Before the first shots are fired, when the southern states are still announcing their succession, there is pressure on the Cherokee to choose sides. Both sides considered uh, Indian Territory a buffer zone, uh, Kansas to the north and Texas to the south. But it was more important to the Confederacy because they thought they would be vulnerable for an attack through Indian Territory, which is why they aggressively recruited Native Americans to fight there. Confederate recruiters promised the Cherokee a place within the Confederate Congress and a way to continue a lifestyle that is, in many ways, Southern. Many of the Cherokees had plantations, just like you'd find in Mississippi or Alabama. They were wearing their hair long and curled at the end and were wearing gentlemen's finery. They were living the life as Southerners, many of them Southern planters, with slaves. Slaves here in the Indian Territory had a little bit more freedom than they necessarily would in the South. They were able to carry weapons. They were able to deal with cash. They were allowed to live in, in their own quarters. So it wasn't exactly freedom out here, so don't get me wrong at that. It was definitely slavery, but it was a little bit more relaxed than in the general South. The Union, by contrast, seems to give up on the Indian Territory. At the onset of the war, uh, Union soldiers were taken from the West. Most of the forts were closed up and they were sent east, basically to guard Washington, D.C. The Union troops were basically sent eastward from April and May of 1861 and were to abandon Indian territory to Confederate forces. The move leaves John Ross, who has long enjoyed the support of the federal government, in a vulnerable position. A vulnerability that Stan Weighty is quick to exploit. Stan Weighty, for example, he gathered up a bunch of troops to support the Confederacy even before the Confederacy had a president. So the political lines were drawn on the old treaties. Weighty, I believe, saw the, the Civil War as an opportunity to set the record straight and not so much by putting the hatchet in those that had killed his uncle and his cousins and his brother and had attempted on his life, but to set the record straight by handing the power of the government over to a group of individuals that had and was responsible for setting the course of the Cherokee people. When the Confederates offer Weighty a commandership, he eagerly accepts. The Indian territories are about to be torn by a civil war within a civil war. There was a vendetta that was right under the surface, and Stan Weighty, to some degree, saw his chance during the Civil War to take back the Cherokee Nation. It is the summer of 1862. The Union forces that had pulled out of Indian Territory a year before return in force. They fight their way back over the Kansas border and retake Fort Gibson. This so-called buffer zone the no man's land between the forces of the North and the South is too important to abandon to the Confederacy. It's really a gateway to get to Arkansas and then to the Mississippi and then ultimately to New Orleans. Not to mention your, your way down to Texas. 
So they really saw it as a key element to preserving the West. The Union was worried about losing Missouri. They saw if they lost Missouri, then the whole Western theater would fall. Three days after they retake Fort Gibson, the Union soldiers are approached by John Ross, official leader of the Cherokee, though actually he represents only a faction. The other half of the tribe, led by his longtime rival Stan Waity, has already joined the Confederacy. A lot of the Civil War in Indian Territory had more to do with the old blood feud vendettas than it did with national issues. It's really more along political lines than it is anything else. The Union sends Ross to Fort Scott, Kansas for protection. He eventually makes his way to Washington, where he spends the rest of the war pleading the Cherokee cause to the government. He went to Washington and lobbied for the Cherokees, saying that not all the Cherokees were bad, that many of them supported the Union and uh, were fighting for the Union. But Stan Waity is doing much to refute those claims. He becomes known as the territory's most formidable guerrilla fighter. His specialty was, was truly uh, keeping a, a, a mounted rifle unit. It's really kind of an 1840s uh, terminology in the Army used to describe what we today would, would term as a Green Beret unit. These were highly mobile individuals with a wide variety of skills that could live off of the land and they could hit very hard and totally dissipate into the, uh, into the countryside. Early on, Waity participates in several regimented battles in and around Indian Territory. Most notably, the Battle of Wilson's Creek in 1861, after which he is made a colonel in the Confederate Army. But he soon decides that conventional warfare is not for him. In the beginning of the war, Stan Waity is almost captured twice. Uh, at Cowskin Prairie and then again at Fort Wayne. And he learned from that very quickly that he didn't want to do a set piece with the Union because they were generally better equipped and uh, uh, better trained. And that's do a set piece battle, Napoleonic style. In 1862, when the Union Army returns to Indian Territory, Waity finds a more suitable target. Stan Waity saw to it that not only Fort Gibson was being harassed after its reoccupation by federal troops, but their supply lines coming out of Fort Scott, Kansas were under constant harassment or seizure by uh, Stan Waity and his men. Any Union soldier who leaves the safety of the fort risks a deadly encounter. He became a hit-and-run artist, and he was very good at it. That success is reflected in the unorthodox appearance of his men. Uh, Wadey's boys uh, are accused many times of being dressed as Federals. The Confederacy wasn't able to send them uh, uniforms or equipment or ammunition or food. So the only place that the Confederates, if they wanted to uh, keep themselves fed, clothed, and uh, supplied with ammunition, was to take it from the Union. Supplies of any kind are scarce in Indian Territory. In the course of the war, nearly every settlement is put to the torch. More than 90 battles will be fought in its streets and fields as the Confederates use it to draw in and bog down more and more Union troops. To a large extent, it was a way to divert Union attention from the Eastern Front. And that was one of the centers of, of the strategy of the Confederacy. Each time a major Confederate campaign is launched in the East, Stan Waity redoubles his attacks along the Kansas border, drawing Union soldiers away from where they are needed most. The frustrated Federal troops make Waity their primary target, as his daring raids capture the imagination of the public and the press, which dubs him the Red Fox. They call Stan Waity the Red Fox. Um, because he was slippery and hard to catch. And uh, he'd appear when you would least expect him to, getting your chickens out of the chicken coop, so to speak. But Waity's greatest fame comes near the end of the war, shortly after his promotion to Brigadier General. In the summer of 1864, 
Waitie learns from a prisoner of war that a Union wagon train bearing a million dollars worth of supplies is about to leave Fort Scott for Fort Gibson. They're supplying uh, about 3,000 troops and about 9,000 refugees. Uh, so that's a lot of food supplies, tentage, clothing that all has to come down in here. 300 wagons pulled by four up mules. Uh, so it was huge. Waitie knows the route they will take. He confers with one of his white counterparts, a Texas Brigadier General named Richard Gano, and outlines a daring plan of attack. On September 18th, the two generals gather some 2,000 troops, half white, half Cherokee, on the high bluffs around Cabin Creek. As darkness falls, they approach the spot where the wagon train, guarded by about 460 well-armed federal troops, has camped for the night. Troops are bedded down for the most part, you know, they got their boots off, they got their shoes off, their, their uh, rifles are stacked. Uh, they're either in their tents or laying out on the stars, and they're asleep. Mules are quietly grazing. Under cover of darkness, Waitie's men ford the creek and approach from the west. Gano's men close in from the east. The creek itself becomes their third flank. Their first target, however, is not the sleeping men, but the mules tethered a short distance away. And the next thing you know, there's cannon fire. The mules stampede, taking with them the only chance the Union has to move their wagons out of the line of fire. Now you're waking up out of a dead sleep to cannon fire, first of all. Then you're trying to get your shoes on, you're trying to find your rifle, and mules are running through, just kicking and going crazy. It's at night, you're disoriented, you have no idea of where, you, where to set a line of battle. You have no idea where the enemy is coming from. In the confusion, the federal troops break and run. So the Union never could really put up a good defense. And then the Confederates just swooped down on top of them. With more than 160 federal troops killed or wounded and only 45 Confederate dead, Waity and Gano load up what they can and burn the rest of the supply train. There's some 300 wagons, hundreds of mules and livestock were taken in that raid and in each of those wagons badly needed food, clothing, armament, powder, all of the munitions and supplies needed to continue the war. The generals managed to elude the reinforcements sent from Fort Gibson and escape with their prize. The high-profile victory unnerves the Union and boosts Confederate morale. The South seems poised to take back Indian territory and push northward, but it is not to be. In the East, the Union General William Tecumseh Sherman has reached Atlanta. The tide is about to turn. Unfortunately, as big as that victory was, and it was lauded all the way to uh, Jefferson Davis' office, still it was too little too late for the Confederacy and the Cherokee Nation. The Confederate forces are destined to be drawn away from their successes in the Indian Territory. Another conflict, unfolding hundreds of miles away, is about to change the momentum of the war. Deep in the swamps of the South, another warrior readies for battle. Like Stan Waity, his is not a fight of ideology or of the issues of succession or slavery, but a war of personal retribution and revenge. The year is 1865, just before spring. No one yet knows it, but another change is in the air. The final days of the Civil War are coming. On a humble farm near Pembroke, North Carolina, several members of the Lumbee tribe gather by a makeshift grave. Those who lie within have been dead only a few hours, shot execution style. It is over this freshly turned earth that an oath is sworn. The Lumbee will fight the Confederacy with everything they have. And as poorly armed as they are, it will be enough to help turn the tide of the war. This killing is just the latest in a conflict that began two years before in what is now Robeson County. 
The Lumbees that live there then, as now, are survivors, descendants of just a few tight-knit families. Unlike the many Native Americans who were forcibly removed west, the Lumbees continued to exist on the fringes of society. They were disenfranchised and they lived on the, the edges of the swamp. Uh, their fear of the outside world led them to retreat into less accessible areas of the South for survival. That's to a large extent why they're there today, why they have survived, uh, by being hidden within Southern society. By staying largely out of sight, the Lumbees avoid many of the restrictions being brought to bear on Native peoples living in the South. In 1831, there was a major slave rebellion called the Nat Turner Rebellion in South Hampton County, Virginia. The result was the South began to pass all kinds of laws restricting movements of people of color, including Native Americans, fearing that Native Americans and African Americans would ally. The legislature took away the right to vote, the right to uh, uh, testify against whites, the right to be on juries. But in 1840, the General Assembly decided that people who were non-whites could not carry or possess firearms. But in 1861, with the coming of the war, the Lumbees lose their carefully guarded anonymity. They are suddenly subject to a new kind of scrutiny. Not as free persons of color, but as free labor. The Confederacy embarked on a very ambitious engineering project and they decided to build a system of elaborate forts that would protect uh, the town of Wilmington, which was their main port. It had uh, all of their uh, destroyers and uh, the Confederate Navy was also stationed there. Built near the mouth of the Cape Fear River out of earth, sand and timbers, Fort Fisher will become the largest southern fortification built during the war with batteries reaching as high as 60 feet. The Confederates started building this massive fort that they called it the Gibraltar of the South Atlantic. But they needed labor to build this fortification. It was a yellow fever epidemic that uh, took away a, about 10% of the labor force and then others had ru just run off because it was backbreaking work. So the uh, Confederacy decided that they would use uh, slaves to help out, but they also decided that the Lumbee tribe would be conscripted. The conscripts are forced to work long hours with little food or rest, often standing waist-deep in water, exposed to malaria and yellow fever. The conditions at Fort Fisher were, were terrible, but also the fact that the Native Americans were put into a slave status antagonized the Native Americans. Uh, the Lumbees especially, because they had always prided themselves as being independent peoples. But it does not take long for this independence to reassert itself. During this time of hard labor, many of the Lumbee young men were able to escape, and they uh, took to the impenetrable swampland, which was a practice called lying out. Deep in the woods and swamps, the Lumbees join up with runaway slaves and escaped Union prisoners, forming a multicultural underground band that survives by their wits. The knowledge that the native peoples, the Lumbees, had of that region, surviving for several hundred years in that region, gave them substantial advantage. They knew the physical geography, they knew the swamps, they knew how to elude the conscription officers. The North Carolina Home Guard, which was basically an arm of the Confederate Army, uh, couldn't get into the swamps, could not capture these people, and so they did take it out on their families in the Lumbee community. In 1864, with their families vulnerable and starving, and many of their menfolk turned into virtual slaves, the fugitives begin striking back. Roused to action by a member of one of the families hardest hit by the conscriptions, 18-year-old Henry Berry Lowry. Henry Berry Lowry started raiding not because he was against the Confederacy and loyal to the Union. It was basically for tribal survival. They were starving to death, and so he thought that by raiding the wealthy plantations, he could uh, feed the community, and he did. 
both white and red, he fed them and slowly became a folk hero, probably as legendary as Robin Hood. Over time, the raiders grow bolder and more violent. They began to retaliate against the home guards who conscripted them. Henry Berry would go out and target certain people, the wealthy plantation owners, he would not harm them, whereas the people who were conscripting Lung B men, he would kill them. The Confederate Home Guard extract their own retribution for these attacks. One of the most brutal reprisals comes in the spring of 1865 on the Lowry family farm. Alan Lowry, Henry Berry's father, was accused of stealing livestock and harboring Union soldiers. The Home Guard came to investigate and they arrested Alan and his brother. Some versions of the story state that Henry Berry Lowry was not home at that time, but most claim that he was hiding in the bushes and watched as his father and his uncle dug their own graves and were shot dead. It is over this grave that Henry Barry Lowry and his band swear to do all they can to thwart the Confederacy. Fate presents them with an opportunity just days later. In March of 1865, General William Tecumseh Sherman, having burned Atlanta and made his legendary march to the sea, is called to return north. Ulysses S. Grant wants him to come by sea to Virginia and join the Army of the Potomac. But Sherman has a daring plan, a bold strike into the very heart of the Confederacy. He will march northward through the Carolinas, trapping the forces of Robert E. Lee between their two armies. But to do so, he must find his way through the Carolinas' impenetrable swamps. When General Sherman came through the Carolinas on his march to the sea, his journey might have bogged down in North Carolina. It is the Lumbees and the outlaw Lowry gang who come to Sherman's aid and show him the fastest way through the swamps. They will guide his men, including a contingent of Native American infantrymen, members of Wisconsin's Oneida tribe, through the swamps and north to victory. But it is a victory in which the Native recruits will not share. Native Americans returned home with hopes of rebuilding their lives and with hopes of gaining what they had lost, but it was just the opposite. Appomattox, Virginia, April 9, 1865. In the waning days of the Civil War, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant negotiate the terms of the Confederate surrender. Keeping the record of the terms is Grant's right-hand man, E. Lee Parker a high-ranking member of the Tonawanda Seneca Nation. He actually drew up the Articles of Surrender under orders from General Grant that General Lee signed at Appomattox. It takes several weeks for the news to reach Indian Territory in what is now Oklahoma. There, Cherokee leader and Confederate Brigadier General Stan Waitie reacts with disbelief. He knows little of the disasters the Confederates have been suffering in the Eastern Theater, which has been overrun by the returning armies of William Tecumseh Sherman. He has only seen successes of late along the Kansas border, successes that owe much to the guerrilla skills of his Cherokee forces. Although stellar battle victories, the war was in fact lost from under his feet. It will be nearly three months after Lee's surrender that Waitie finally lays down his arms. He will go down in history as the last Confederate general to surrender. But even then, he does so only after the government meets his terms. Well, he's negotiating because the United States is prepared to negotiate. Basically says we're having to put our arms down, but we have shown, you know, despite the odds, that we are a fierce people and we will fight till we can't fight anymore. Waity extracts a promise from the government that the property of the Cherokees, even those who fought for the Confederacy, will be protected from encroachment. But it is a promise that will never be kept. In fact, they uh, started losing more of their entitlements and uh, were made to suffer even further by threat of losing their land. 
The U.S. government now maintains that because Stan Waity and other Cherokees sided with the Confederacy, the land treaties they had negotiated before the war are null and void. The new agreements will be far less favorable. By the time that the Treaty of 1866 was struck, there was one intent on the part of the United States to once again erode away and to diminish the power and stability of the Cherokee Nation. Between 1889 and 1906, what had been Indian territory is subjected to a series of land runs. Three million acres of what will be the state of Oklahoma are open to white settlement. Stan Waity's old enemy John Ross dies in Washington in 1866, a chief in name only, in self-imposed exile from the Cherokee Nation. Stan Waity returns to his lands but suffers a series of financial and personal setbacks after the war. Not only does he, he lose his wealth and his property, but his family as well. Sons are dead. Uh, his, his daughters only outlived him by two years. If not for extended family members and cousins, the, the line of Stan Waity would have relatively been eradicated within only a handful of years after the end of the Civil War. Today, the opinion of the Cherokee remains divided over the actions of Waity's treaty party and the character of Waity himself. Well, he was not only admired uh, among people that followed him, but among the Confederate uh, command. Uh, so he was recognized as being a great leader. There are his detractors too, because he was making war against his own people. It would be uh, asking today if uh, Snoop Dogg were a hero. Depends on who you ask. In the South, meanwhile, Henry Barry Lowry and the Lumbee Indians who helped guide Sherman's armies through the swamps remain outlaws to the whites. The Confederate Home Guard basically transformed themselves into the Ku Klux Klan and just continued on with business as usual. In 1869, the governor of North Carolina put a bounty on the head of Henry Barry Lowry and his gang, but they continued to raid and were basically living legends in Robeson County. It's a remarkable legend because he is a, a culture hero of the Lumbee people to this day. Stan Waity, Henry Barry Lowry, Ely Parker, Though they were heralded by their tribes, the contributions of these warriors are quickly brushed aside by the whites. After the war, Native Americans are once again seen not as allies, but as obstacles in the way of progress. The whites wanted their land, as they always had, so they were tricked into giving it up through various treaties, through bribery, or just through intimidation. The moment of cooperation and opportunity has passed. Despite the valiant service of Native Americans to both sides, they receive little recognition. One exception comes in the last moments of the war, during the surrender at Appomattox, when Ulysses S. Grant formally introduces his staff to Robert E. Lee. There's a large unknown quality to that surrender. We have the writings of General Porter, who was a very important figure at the surrender, and he says that General Lee was startled by the presence of Parker. A legend has sprung up around the moment when Lee faced Ely Parker. When the Native American officer extended his hand, Lee is said to have hesitated, but quickly recovered. Lee was kind of taken back by this because here's a man of color standing in front of him. Then he recognized him as being Native American. The exchange that was recorded next would provide an ironic postscript to what had once been called a white man's war. He says, well, it's nice. He says, we've got a real American amongst us. And then Parker comes back as, well, we are all Americans. Mm -hmm.